um, it's a means that I started in 2004 here. Yeah. In that panel, everybody spoke Visayan. So I'd like to start my speech by giving thanks to the host Visayan. Dahil nga, salamat nga, i-invitar ko ninyo din eh. Uh, Dilihim na ako buwan hindi rin kahit tiguwang na minata. Panuhot na ito, sakit na nga iba. Nandun sa oras sa biyahe, wala yung tikasin oil sa Hawaii. Pero si Kiko, ako man ang isudyante sa una, sa UP, hindi mo ka makaingon o balibad, hindi ka makabalibad kang Kiko. Ngayon, ang kanuha ka rin na na ako nun eh, yun siya sa Cebu daw, himuon ang konferen. Cebu, uy! Dugay na ang gimingaw na ko sa Cebu, kaya wala ang katilaw o siyakoy o glitsyon sa talisay. So ang taxi driver na ako ngayong gabi, yung mga pangitahe ko glitsyon sa talisay ba ito, yung musibat na diri. Ang akong namispon, ang puto maya o mangga o sikawati sa karbon. Pero wala ko kamatag sa iyo, busa diri na lang pupukaon. Okay, lami. Oh, ang katungulo ka rin so, nga niya ako din eh, is um, um, <laughs> makabinisya ba ta? So, maya nung binisya ta dahil kaya madilim saya ng mga anak to. <laughs> so, uh, humana akong kuhan, dahil salamat niya ko sa PPSA, pag-imilaran ako, karong mabal mong balita ta sa inyengles, o mangit, ah, uh, mga ipasailo ninyo, ah, usahin ka kung taga-usami sa mga ko, gahe kayong binisya, mag-ingles, so, Understand na lang, no? Uh, so, Kiko invite, invited me kay I'm supposed to be controversial, so I have to uh, play that role. So, let me start with this, okay? Uh, first, he asked me if I could say something about Duterte. Ah, boring my everybody's gonna fight about Duterte today. So, let's do something else. But let me start with Duterte, okay? So, on June 4, 2016, 28.18 minutes after the YouTube video of his rumbling victory speech at Davao City's Crocodile Park, newly elected President Rodrigo Duterte authored these remarks. Uh, the Visayans can please translate this to the non-Visayans. And uh, those who are Christians, please cover your ears. Okay. <laughs> and this is what he said. Napay usa ka reporter nga rin. Ikaw pa ngilad. Numata na og, how is your health? Iyon na ako, I'm fine, I'm good. Sagot pa naman sa ako, putang ina, saan yung medical report mo? Binastos gani. E, giing na ako, ayaw na lang, ako himat yun. Pagdawas ako'y kontrabida, may ba na anay ni mong tao? Kung giing nang taka, kumusta ang kondisyon sa bisong sa inyong asawa? Yung sa may iyak, nababaginite, kay bahura ba na? E, ganun eh, binastos man ko. Kapila na doon kami eleksyon, ipungunta na ko, kaming Rojas. May abot may sinagpaay. Kanya ingat siya nga, hindi ka report. Ayaw na lang, maghubo na lang ta, pada ka na yung takutin. Gusto ka, kahit na mayroon takutin, kahit ikot makalubot. Bayo. Now, if you watch the reaction of the people in that YouTube, when you try to mention the word bisong, which is the Visayan slang for vagina, and the smallness of rival president candidate Manuel Rojas Espinas, you will not notice the blank looks among many of those on the stage, especially people like uh, Vice uh, Alan Pilar Cayetano, but you will hear howls of laughter among the audience, including the women. Okay. And it was while I was being shocked and laughing as an Osamison, uh, that while watching the gong, that I realized how emblematic his speech was of the disconnect between local power and how academics and policy makers attempt to make sense of the president's politics. Scholars, policies, policy makers, pundits, and I dare say political scientists, you can throw stones at me later, continue to be flummoxed by the 30s resilient popularity and unpresidential actions. And very often we push to a corner. Our sages' reflections are demand, or our sages' reflections are demanded on popular media. Most of us, most of our response is to tiptoe around conjectures and generalities. Okay. And I think there are three factors to consider when looking at this baffle men. Okay. First is the obvious relative ignorance by many of Davao cities and the other larger Davao regions history. When we await a comprehensive study on these two zones, especially, we still await a comprehensive study on these two zones, especially during the martial law 
and post authoritarian periods. But more broadly, and then you can throw stones at me later, I also believe that the study of local politics remains underdeveloped in this discipline. Okay? The best works on the topic so far have been written by journalists. Remember the book, Boss 5, Case Studies of Local Politics in the Philippines, edited by journalist Sheila Cordell. And of, I remember Glenda Gloria's answer past study in the United Historians, Michael Collinett's new ones, and very funny study of Ramon Durano in the edited volume, Lives of the Margins, Biography of Filipinos, Obscure, Ordinary, and Heroic. And sociologist, Pancho Lara's path-breaking book, Insurgent Clans and States, Political Legitimacy and Resurgent Conflict in Muslim Now, That's why I'm very excited that there's so many panels on local politics now because I think I stand corrected with this. Okay. Now, the second reason is, of course, linguistic. Bisayak is the favored idiom of Bisayan and Mindanao politicians, quite effective in mobilizing constituents, especially when laced with profanities and English aside. Yeah, uh, those of you who are Bisayan remember the song about Fernando Lopez. You, know? you don't remember that? Yeah. The song is like my own taco spaghetti. Fernando for Lopez, who are like Cansulis, Italy, this is public service. Uh, for those things. English and the occasional dash of Tagalog are, of course, the argot scholars like you are used to get tenure, to earn promotion, debate with colleagues, and get published. The story behind the Gong speech will be passed around in different popular spaces and in the everyday lives of the Zions, whose discussions will likely include examining the nature of Davao Tagalog or spotting the Davao Pidgin of Danao Visayan. Um, academics, however, will be unfamiliar with the language or its various slang and therefore will be forced to deconstruct his politics on, based on English translations of the Gong speak or seek other similar primary sources, translated of course, to give a compelling examination of the president's actions to the limited group of academic readers. The third reason goes out to the two disconnects. However, instead of doubling down on Digong, since everyone, I guess, will be fighting about him today, let me instead move elsewhere and pose this puzzle to you. And this is the, uh, 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 the core of my paper. What would state formation and state and society relationship look like okay, if you encounter a mono woman with the last name of Tan, sitting in her Panglima Sugala hut, sorting out, sorting out knock off iPhones and Blackberries from Southern China, Malong from Indonesia, five-in-one coffee sachets from Malaysia, copies of the digitized version of the famous Japanese war movie Ichijos, uh, Ichijos Wet Lust, and bullets from the Fabrik National Carabin of the Belgian made rifle stolen from the Indonesian army. By Tan is doing all of this, while watching reruns of her favorite Indonesian drama series, Love in Paris, featuring the Hank and Lilo Claudio look-alike, Dimos Angara. On a rewired Japanese-made TV, she bought chip from a Filipino crew of a member of the Panamanian-owned cargo ship passing through the area. Occasionally, she glances at her cell phone, expecting a text from a Saudi Arabia-based daughter, will tell her how much she will remit to the Banco de Oro uh, branch in Tawi Tawi, and she hopes to get the text before 1 p.m. because past that time, if she decides to take her bank at the Tawi Tawi, the currents will shift and she will end up in Bukaan, Gorontalo province, southern Sulawesi, northern Sulawesi. So here we have a citizen who is a felon by livelihood, okay. a Filipino cedula holder whose mental world is global. Northern Sulawesi, Saudi Arabia, Panamian cargo ship, Japanese television and porn, Indonesian telenovela, Malaysian coffee, Indonesian malo, Southern Chinese uh, iPhones, and most sure, and, um, and many else. Okay? She is Muslim, but comfortable with marketing the most un-Islamic of goods, Ichiju's wet glass and bullets. She lives at the edge of the national territory, and Lima Sugala is a beautiful island east of Tawi Tawi. A site, the Sulu, a site, the Sulu Zoom, where state works with state leaders, and I dare say political scientists, regard with trepidation because this is where political disorder is supposed to be at its most intense, and the nation state is 
and its weakest. She is Moro and Chinese, the spawn of two minority groups that people in the center mistrust the most. Remember that racist runs of the national artist F. Chanel Jose regarding the Chinese, and recall the 2004 Philippine Human Development Report survey where millennials were uh, surveyed about their views on Muslims and 48% of them said Muslims tend to run amok. Okay. So how would you place Baitan in the world of Philippine politics? I would suggest that this is not an easy task, especially since as a matter of habit, we always assume that national develop political development is defined by the metropolis and that national politics is nothing but the institutional and political combat of national elites at the national capital. Political engagements about the, uh, outside of the capital are ancillary, if not insignificant, especially if they fail to fit the national nationalist or prison. So this is a point of view that also represents conventional approaches to local politics, which tend to replicate the analytical lenses of Manila by looking at provincial and town elites while marginalizing actors like Baitan and many others from their local ethnicistic narratives and topologies. Now let me parse this argument by starting with Baitan's gender, okay? So I hope you're not angry yet. The page is coming. The 30 pages more. The feminist politics may have the may have made the oppression and exploitation of Filipinas more visible in the last decades. But the focus is on the open struggle by women activists, movements, and organizations. The subtle everyday forms of ever resistance, in that which James C. Scott calls the hidden transcripts, are still unwritten. The late Professor Albina Fernandez shared the story about Leonard Wood, noting that who was who noted that the best leaders in the Philippines were not the likes of Manuel Quezon or Sergio Osmeña but there were the women that he encountered while he was American Governor General of the Philippines. This prompted Professor Fernandez to ask, if this is true, how come women in the Philippines are invisible in the history books? Maria Lourdes Camaga was aware of this defect and appealed to her fellow historians to look at the data in quote, iconographic evidence, says, such as pictures, literature, diaries, letters, and those that are derived from oral history. So that, she said, we could move towards the task of systematic, quote unquote, quote, systematically setting up a clearing house for information specifically for women. The mother, however, was aware of that minefield that her feminist colleagues might get into. She cautioned that women writing about women, based on such alternative evidence, would inevitably come up with the conclusion that will put the question in national history that is, unfortunately, deeply male-oriented. Strong men, presidents, cyclones, gangsters, and revolutionaries are the favored historical actors. And when their wives or mistresses find themselves at their political center, they must either act like their male center partners or quietly stand beside their men. Those who refuse to quote, act appropriately do not get a role in the plot of the family and the national story. They get erased. So think of what would have happened to Imelda Romualdez if her father did not move his mistress and her children from the garage to the first family's home. But what if it turned Kamaga's observation upside down and unwrapped, tried to unwrap the hidden transcripts? If we do this, then it may be the case that the reason men hide their women partners is because they know, and their audience know, who controls the levers of power. Okay. Placing women behind the curtain or making them stand like statues beside their male partners could in fact be a ruse to pretend that men dominate. It is a scam that everyone is into, but more so the women because for them, cloud is the most effective whether it's in stealth mode. What makes it doubly difficult to figure out the characters of this authority is the near absence of any study, political study, of the political Filipina. So except for Mina Rossi's preliminary investigations of the Filipina Borghese, we still do not have a full feminist study of Imelda Marcos and her arch rival Corazon Aquino. For the most part, we are content with the existing literature's depiction of Madame Marcos as the grotesque subordinate of her husband, and Tita Cori as a weak wife of an ambitious senator 
and later the weak president that the left and the right caricatured to be because she messed up the return of constitutional politics. And when Corey did turn against the communists, Corey had to be masculinized to make her fit the portrait of a tyrant in democratic and Christian clothing. Yet if you are private to what happens behind the corners, in the bedroom, on the backstage, or at the margins of political and district meetings, what will become gradually evident is how the nexus of power is regulated by these women. You may hate Imelda, but Imelda had kept her family out of jail by deploying an array of political and legal weapons that her money could buy. Corey quietly managed complex family business of companies before she became president. And did she not successfully push back machos like Marcos, Johnny Ponce Rile, Doy Laurel, and Gringo Hanasans, and his merry bunch of failed co -platters? The same holds true with more women elites. Professor Vivian Angeles has written the only piece of the late Desdemona Miswari and mentioned her influence in the thinking of her husband, Noor. By Desdemona had predecessors, and these are really funny stories I found on the archives. Uh, there was Princess Piando, you don't know who Princess Piando is now, who quietly um, hinted to the incoming district officer, Lieutenant Colonel Sidney Cloban, who the real authority by insisting that her husband, Sultan Jamal Keram, wear a termite ravaged tuxedo that he used to wear while trading in British Singapore. Or how about Sultan of Piando's niece, the American educated Karhat Kiram, who married the strongman Dato Latahil Lidasan, then convinced him to lead a failed uprising against Moro Province Governor John Pershing, and this revolt is praised by Moro historians, by historians of Muslim Mindanao, as yet another sign of Moro resistance to colonial rule. But when in fact, it was Kiram's wonderful ploy to get rid of Lidasan so she could marry Dato Buyuman and make Lidasan languish in jail. So moreover, women often privilege the informal over the normal, the non-official over the official, as this allows them the flexibility to expand their influence. In their book, Kirida, Caroline Howe, Karina Tovera, and Isabella Torres beautifully captures the extent of the Kabit's influence. And let me quote what they said. The Kirida's sexual allure, her erotic capital, is a cliché. But her superior access to social, cultural, and financial capital is well-networked, well-educated, and wealthy. It's potentially unsettling of marriage in the male order social order. Now think of Baby Arenas, and before her downfall, the former student activist, Gigi Reyes. Yet, if we are to make women truly visible in our historical and political writings, how would this affect our male-centered, nation-driven, capital-focused narrative? Can the latter withstand the pressure of the diverse viewpoints on women's experience that's resulting from culture, class, race, ethnicity, age, and sexual orientation? Now, Baitan is not only a woman, she is also Moro. And when you factor her ethnicity, ethnic identity and figure out its relations to national politics, this will inevitably bring us to the separatist rebellions of the MNLF and the MILF. The literature on these armed rebellions traced their growth to more fears that the Philippine state, colonial but later more post-colonial, has been engaged in the genocidal wars against the Moro. Largely underappreciated and rather in parallel to this is the resilient belief that Americans had consistently been the Moro's friend and ally. Historian Samitan and the student of history, Rodrigo Duterte, were right in reminding us that the Marian waged a bloody war against the Moros. However, they made very little fact of the little of the fact that after peace was established, the American soldiers also became the Moros public school teachers, as well as the dogged, dog, dogged co-defenders against the forced integration of the Moros to the Ugda Uma to the Philippine nation state. The Datos ended up compromising with the colonial state and its Republican successor, but communities remained nostalgic of the days of the, what they called the Melicans. What kept these fundists for the colonizer alive was the failure of the national state to establish legitimacy in Moro Mindanao via a public school system that could have educated Muslims about their quote alleged Filipino heritage. It did not also help that their elites acted like local satraps 
imbued with the right to loot the local state. Now, this failure to erase a built-in colonial rule in the Moro's popular memory helps explain such peculiar political moves like the 1930 Dan Salad Declaration of Maranao Datos appealing to the United States to set Mindanao before the Commonwealth was established. It helps explain why the MNLF insisted that USAID be involved in the post-war rehabilitation of Norman Mindanao. It also explains the enduring trust the Americans the MILF had on the Americans when the late MILF chairman Salim Hassan, Salama Tashim wrote to President George W. Bush asking that the U.S. commediate with Malaysia in the peace negotiation with the Ramos government. And finally, it helps explain why 70% of Muslims when asked if they want the Americans in Mindanao, they would say yes. It did not help, of course, that the first and for a long while, the only symbol of the Philippine national state in Moro Mindanao was the AFP soldier shooting at the fathers, the mothers, and children and burning the houses of Moros. But then, War is not only, is only just a small part of Biden's life. In fact, what may be more important than the MNLF and the MILF is our main livelihood as a buyer, negotiator, seller of smuggled goods mentioned above. So what of it, okay? In the eyes of the nation state, Biden is a criminal, no? He's a member of an underground trading network that's subversive of the national political economy. This illicit sector trades in commodities that are untaxed and much of the time cheaper compared to the legal, highly priced and taxable competitors. Now consider, for example, the price of a real blackberry to the smuggled blueberry. <laughs> or the price of the real Viagra as against the Chinese made Viagra. Yeah. <laughs> Smuggling must therefore be thoroughly eradicated by the nation state for the well-being, for its well-being and its protection. Unfortunately, the state could not do away with the illicit sector since smuggling has always been, whether you like it or not, very much part of our lives. Okay. The presence of the underground economy has become quite pervasive. It rose to 50% of the GDP in 2002. It went down to 35% after that, but has stayed in that level ever since. One study concluded that between 1960, both 1960 and 2011, Illicit financial flows from the Philippines totaled 132.9 billion not pesos dollars. Okay. While illicit inflows amounted to 277.6 billion. The report, report added that over 50 percent in over the 50 percent per 50 year time span, community in financial flows into and out of the Philippines totaled what 410 billion dollars, making the Philippines the sixth largest exporter of illicit capital in the developing world. Neither can smuggling be written off as a recurring dark episode of our national political development because it's an organic part of the development. In this impressive book called Policing America's Empire, the United States, the Philippines, and the Rise of the Surveillance State, Al McCoy maintains that the illicit sector has always been indispensable to the success of major Filipino political leaders going as far back as the time of Quezon, providing funds and manpower for their campaigns. So for McCoy, Filipino leaders were not just masters of the spoil system and patronage politics, they were also major economic players in the, in the economic nether world. Uh, one of the things I want to ask you guys later is, what would a smuggler's cost-benefit analysis look like? <laughs> now, adding him to a smuggler's power, is a realm, that, a realm that cuts across several nation states and covers a swath of land and sea from maritime and mainland Southeast Asia to Southeast China to Japan or even as far as Vladivostok. It is a sprawling zone that has a history longer than that of the Philippine nation state. The smugglers of today belong to a long line of merchants that go back as far as the pre-colonial period. Thoroughly familiar with the terrain, their forefathers crisscrossed trading routes across the region where the authority of the charismatic, audacious, and business savvy strong men, the Indonesians called them Orang Besar, or strong women, the Juanita Besar, wax and wane according to their ability to trade and engage in warfare. Now recall the colonial period began not with the British, the Dutch, or Spanish armies conquering Southeast Asia, 
in fact, attempting to tap into and insert themselves into this maritime trading network, initially as minor players and sometimes with fatal results, as illustrated by the end of Magellan in the Battle of Actan, as wonderfully implemented in our memories of the great Visayan balladeer, Yoyo Villame. The British did this too in Malaysia, setting up trading arrangements in the early years with the sultans of Johor and Krak before they started to take on more state-like functions with the creation of the Federated States of Malaya. Now, despite the relative success of colonial national states in restricting and rechanneling this world into the more constricted space of the nation-state, community loyalty to the smugglers' world has never disappeared because of its older pedigree. And it's a very robust one. The cosmopolitanism of the smugglers' realm is the result of its participants being linguistic and political chameleons. People who live in places like Panglima Sugala, Tawi-Tawi, peripheries of the Philippine nation states, are polyglot by nature, switching languages and identities with ease in a trading zone where being multilingual is the norm. So on a given day, in Basila and Tawi-Tawi, you can hear people effortlessly conversing in Bahasa Malaysia, Bahasa Indonesia, Visayan, Tagalog, Taosok, Maguindanao, Hokkien, Maranao, a little Arabic, and some English. Okay. So the Miles Smuggler's World is a literary tower of Babel, which unlike which but which unlike the biblical denizens of this mythical turret, the people in the periphery understand each other quite well. Now compare this with to the people who live in the center, familiar with at least two national languages, the Galobisayan, their language of birth, the Galobisayan. Ilocano, in the language for social mobility, English, which is who is more cosmopolitan than them. The contrast in their ways of political thinking are also quite palpable. The islands of Sulu, for example, it is said that for most of the year, the families imagine themselves as ethnic Milayo or Malaysian nationals. The one day they become Filipinos is when their dato tells them to cast their votes for their patron and favored candidates. After exercising their quote-unquote democratic rights, the voters revert to their old Malaysian selves. So how then could the perspective that biases the national center deal with communities whose worldview and everyday life do not cohere with or adhere to what the nation state expects of its citizens? Can be regionally incorporated into national frame. Okay. The last essential outsider is Bai Tan's daughter. In her wonderful book, Global Filipinos, Migrant Lives in the Virtual Village, Deirdre McKay tracks the movement of, a member, of members of a family from the village of Halyak in Ifugao province to Hong Kong and to Bacover. McKay notes, McKay notes how much her subjects long for home, quote unquote, as they traverse the OFW's global network. At first glance, this is not unique. It is the most common sentiment among those of us who leave the country to work abroad. Being good in. But what is interesting here is that home to Makay subject is not the Philippines, but Halya. What they missed was the village, not the nation, friends and relatives, not fellow citizens. In the play last night, there were probably 80% Manila, 80% are all Ilocanos, okay? And all of them landed in Manila waiting for the connecting flight to Lawak. Nobody spoke Tagalog. So moreover, Manila does not figure much in the OFW's pilgrimages. The national capital is only acknowledged as the required transit point in their movement from Halyap to Hong Kong or Vancouver. It is in Manila where they apply for their permits to walk abroad. Once their visas are approved and their passports released, although now you can apply for passports in the provinces, they hastily return to their village, in part to recover from the smoggy and alienating vastness of the national capital. In Haiyan, they await the notice of approval of their applications, and once they receive the affirmation, they leave for their new foreign places, transiting an hour or two in Naia 1 or 2. So you sense that same fleeting movement when the OFW returns to the Philippines after years of being away. She leaves Vancouver, transits into Kaitak International Airport, lands at Dino Aquino International Airport, transfers to the domestic terminal, takes the connecting flight to Loa. Upon landing in the provincial landing strip, is met by the family jeep or a chartered bus and driven to town. 
At the end of a very, very long day, she walks up the stairs to the family house where she can finally relax, enjoy the feeling of being home, and catch up with the local, not national gossip. Sinong nabuntis? Oh, sabi si ano, kago pa rin? Sabi yung boyfriend ko. Not off, you know. Sino presidente na ngayon? So to write about state and society relations is that includes a huge number of Filipinos abroad, 10 million, who are financially indispensable. 12 million, I think, dollars of the mid 2016, but who, have attuned more to the, who are attuned more to the dynamics of their barangay, their municipio, or small city is known in the past. For home can be a flexible concept and is not always equated with the country. So it will require not only telling their stories, but also educating them about the nation to replace localized notions of homes with that of country. But given a perennially weak state and an elite concerned solely with privatizing political power, how much can change, how much can change, how much change can this massive reorientation make in the perspective and fidelities of the OFW? Okay. Now, are this process reversible? Possibly, and I think several existing counterweights short of state coercion exist that can prevent the worsening of these features. For one, like it or not, the Philippines is a sovereign state with a territory recognized by the international system of similar nation states, IR. And given the failed adventures of more separatism, I doubt if we can duplicate what the terrorists did in Indonesia. Second, thanks in part to the nationalization of media, and popular culture, telenovela, the number of Filipinos who believe in the current version of the national narrative is now larger than those who do not believe or are familiar with it. So if post Asia or social weather run the survey question, what are you first, Filipino or? I suspect that most of the respondents will answer the former. And there are also historical conjunctures that we can use to show that national identity uh, apparently prevailed, prevailed in the regions and, and uh, among linguistic divisions. The cry of Pugatlawan, for example, for echoes outside of Manila in my hometown of Misamis where the Spanish mestizo Nicolas Capestano and his Cagayanons marched against the Spaniards. While in Subo, Michael Colony discovered the 120 Cebuano elites who joined the revolution and he would write about them in his latest books, Arenas of Conspiracy and Rebellion in the late 19th century. And who could forget the Igorots who joined the Filipino revolutionaries during the war as wrote written beautifully by the late historian Walter Henry Scott. So with his memories of the struggles for independence or anti-Americanism beyond Manila kept alive in our books, the challenge would then be to how we invigorate and integrate them into the national narrative. Then there is the Chinese. We know that the Chinese have always had a fraught relationship with the state. We started for being illegal immigrants, accused of collaborating with the Muslims and promoting smuggling, uh, uh, suspected ones of being communist fifth column, and late of late being surrogates of the People's Republic of China. But the racist Chanel Jose was wrong when he accused Chinois as Latin traitors in the nation. For in her book, The Chinese Question, Carol Howe argues, the Filipinos and Chinese nationalism were, quote, not always mutually exclusive. The former participated in the anti-Japanese war that later led to the call, calling themselves Wachi warriors, and then a Chinese section of those Wachi warriors joined the Partido Comunista and Filipinas. And in the 1960s, several Chinois were in the protest movement, and some of them, like the writer Ricky Lee, became in contrast of the new Communist Party. How assert that these examples are indicative of both the intimate connections between Chinese and Filipinos in the challenging and uncertain conditions. Minorities and majorities can thus find in nationalism a common basis to work together as well Filipinos. Okay. So now we finally go back to Baitan. The country's internal war have ironic wars of ironically enabled communities which and individuals to talk to each other. And this time in Tagalog. Okay. In 2008, the board of feminists and scholar Rofa Guillaume and I went around uh, Cotabato to interview for uh, uh, MNL cadres who were, uh, communities who were displaced by the MNL war. Um, how did, and especially how they dealt with quote unquote the outsiders, the National Army. And they told us this amazing story of how they had to send their smartest kids to the town schools to learn math, biology, 
or science but quote unquote Filipino. Like many non Tagalog speakers, they hated the imposition of learning in Filipinos. Uh, I feel Filipino, yes. But in this case, we had to, they had to take it seriously because quote unquote Tagalog was the only language that both the villagers and the Ilocano soldiers understood. Having a common language then became the only way to convince the army not to burn their villages and kill their men, and for the saner and more sensitive members of the AFP to dialogue with the intimidated Moros. And did you remember Commander Robot speaking in fluent Tagalog when he explained why the Abu Sayyaf was kidnapping people? The other ironic consequence of the separatist war was that it forced Moros to move to the urban areas where, among other things, they brought with them their illicit trade. The first refugees helped set up the now famous pirated DVD and pearl markets in districts like Greenville, uh, Green Hills, and I think still in the back of Davos, if you hold on. Where, where do you buy the DVD now? They keep moving. But they're all Maranams, no? As, and there, as their business thrived, like many migrant communi communities, they facilitated the integration of kin and business partners left behind the war zones. So today there are 40 mosques in Metro Madrid, Manila, and Muslim zones in the urban core areas have become noticeable. But there is a tendency for different ethnic groups, including Muslims, to set up their own enclaves inside these ghettos. It is impossible to prevent the interaction between fellow provincianos. These are the encounters that become even more intimate. A Japanese student of mine did field research on Christian moral marriages in Tano del Sur and Lano del Norte, observed that such unions, unions were not out of the ordinary, and that both moral and Christian families accepted them wholeheartedly. The wives and husbands continued to practice their respective religions, and the children were given the right to choose their preferred theology. The breaking of the barrier that kept Moros believing that they were never Filipinos and Filipinos discriminating against smart Moros maybe is becoming more and more evident. So today, the pirated DVD, the hijab, and Chinoy movie stars like Kim Chu are part of the country's social life. But to uncover economic, political, and social undercurrents that inform their slow and belated inclusion into the